The sacred divine feminine is creative, abundant, flowing, receiving, and disruptive. And the new energy of money, including cryptocurrency, decentralized finance, NFTs, and even the metaverse, is all these things too. Welcome to the Goddess of Crypto, a weekly show where women who are already in this powerful space will cover these topics simply, so you can relax into knowing that the future of finance is female. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Goddess of Crypto. I have with me today a fascinating woman. Her name is Maria Angelica Alvarado, and she is in business development for a fractional CFO company. If you've never heard of that, it's pretty cool. It means you get a CFO at a time when you need it, but you don't have to pay the full-time salary because you're not always going to have it. So I actually, I have to say, she's not the first a person I've run into who does this kind of work, but it's really fascinating to me. I think that it's an example of kind of the, the way that work is modernizing. So Maria Angelica, welcome. I am super happy to have you here on Goddess of Crypto. Kelly, I am so happy to be here. We met and this the sparks between us flew and I'm so thankful and appreciative of your time and, and inviting me to your to your podcast. It's exciting. No, oh, I'm happy to have you. I, yes, I was very pleased when we, uh, Maria and Helica and I sat out uh, for a uh, coffee for about an hour and a half. And boy, we talked about everything. And I was like, you have to come on the show. It's going to be so much fun. So I'm super glad that you're here. So I want to ask you a little bit about your, uh, your work for starters. Let's, let's start with that. Um, why don't you explain a little bit about why you do what you do and maybe what it's like to be a woman in, in the business that you're in. Absolutely. So it it's funny, it comes full circle. So about 10 years ago, I was a financial advisor and my market was business owners, business owners that had partners because a lot of them don't do buy-sell agreements. They don't have any written um, stipulations on their businesses and things like that. Um, and so I left that. I, I moved on to other things. I got into corporate America. And then now CFO, the company that I'm with now, they do fractional CFO, controller, and bookkeeping services. And they you know, reached out to me through LinkedIn. And I'm like, excuse me, I'm, I'm not a CFO or controller. What is this for? And they're like, no, we want the business development side. We see that you know how to create an ecosystem where you're meeting the decision makers, the center of influences that could be in front of businesses that can use fractional CFO and controller work. And so basically it's project-based. We go in there for a company that is looking for direction and we help them because it's not our first time at the rodeo, but it is their first time at the rodeo. And so whatever questions they've had, we've already, we can sum up that and uh, we're industry agnostic. So yes, it's a lot of networking, which is how you and I met. Um, it's a lot of relationship building, which I think is the long-term game. And then, of course, being a connector of people. So as I meet people in the community, I think, you know what? This person would be great to connect with this person. The synergies there, the collab would be a good idea. It's either going to generate business or just a better value-add proposition for their client base. So it's just a lot of getting to know great people in the business community. Um, Age-wise, it's everyone from in their 20s to people in their 70s. It depends on what industry you're speaking to. So we definitely play in the mergers and acquisitions space. We play in the audit space with um, CPA firms. Of course, in the business world, buying and selling and all that, getting the companies ready, which is more of M&A. But it's, it's just having a diverse financial knowledge. And then we share it. I share it. And how did you get started in this in, in this business in the first place? Like, what attracted you to do this kind of work? It comes back full circle to when I was a financial advisor because I've always had the philosophy: you can fish with a pole or fish with a net. And for me, fishing with a net meant developing uh, networking connections in the community, getting to know my ecosystem of professionals that can refer business, and we could do that back and forth. So there's a lot of reciprocity. So when Nasiafo approached me and they're like, we like the soft skills you have. 
we know you can get into a, a room and get to know who to speak to and then take them out of that room and then, you know, share more about what we do and then find out from them how we can provide them referrals as well. So it's those soft skills that are really tough to find. And it's, and it's hard. It's, it's, it's like, I'm a social butterfly in the business world. I work a room and I find out with the people what I need to find out about them. And then Mm -hmm. business wise. Yeah. And do you think those soft skills are something that as a woman, you have an advantage to be able to have those? I do think so. I think we've always been brought up to be conversationalists. I think that's where, you know, a lot of women get together for coffee. They get together for, you know, good time with their girlfriends. And it's about developing that, that kind of comfort and, and, um, familiarity with someone when you're just meeting them for the first time. But at the same time, it's different in the business sense because yes, you need to come across as both professional and as well as, um, as, as, authentic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, you uh, moved here when you were a little girl. Is that right? Yes. So I'm actually Nicaraguan born over there. Um, during uh, 1981, 1982, my family moved here to Florida um, after there was that communism took over Nicaragua. So we actually uh, got here on 1981, 1982. Yeah. And what was it like for you as a little girl moving here? You know what? It was, I I have memories of me being in school and of course only speaking Spanish at the time. And, and um, it was just challenging, but the school system here was great. My teacher, I'll never forget her. She was so sweet. She, she kind of helped me along and, and then you just acclimate as a kid, you just adapt. And, and you just, at that point, you know, have these two worlds at home. It's Spanish speaking and outside of the, from the front door out, it's, it's the USA and you speak English. So funny enough, my English doesn't have a Spanish accent because I was in a more um, American environment. So even my own counterparts that moved around the same time that they moved to a more Hispanic neighborhood, they don't believe that I speak Spanish. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because in Miami, I've seen there are people who are completely bilingual, no accent in English, perfect yeah. Spanish. And then there are people who their their accent is in English is extremely strong, but yeah. it isn't Spanish. There's like I don't know. I think they call it the Hialeah accent here, where uh, you're because Hialeah, uh, Florida, it's, it's, turns out it's got like it's got like eighty seven percent Cuban as far as the population uh, split, and uh, there and there is like a particular accent where words are. It, it's almost like the New Yorkian. What is it? But that's not what they call it, right? If you're Puerto Rican but you're raised in New York, like the yes. New Yorkian. New York, I, I don't I'm not even saying it right. right. It's, you're you're but, really like trying to stick to your Puerto Rican roots, but you're really born in New York. <laughs> yes, exactly. So there's a certain accent there. And I feel like Hialeah, it, it, like that accent in Miami is, is a certain accent where it, it's not like some words are pronounced differently, but it's not Spanish either. It's nothing like Spanish. So it's, it's very, the, very interesting. It's the vowels. It really has to do with the way the A sounds and the E sounds and everything. Some words when I'm saying them, even though I'm having a conversation in English, I can't say them in English. I have to say them with a Spanish thing like like Venezuela. I can't say Venezuela. Like It, it just comes out in Spanish. I, I can't say it in the English version of it. I, I totally get that. My first exposure to that, I was actually in... Um, it was in my 20s. I was living in Houston and I knew this beautiful blonde actress, sweet little thing, just, you know, the perfect ingenue. And one day she said, I'm going to go for my lunch and I'm going to have empanadas. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and it turned out she was Castilian. And I think they say Castilian. She was Castilian, Castilian Spanish and had like her whole family, the, the, they were all blonde and yet they were all from Spain and she spoke perfect Spanish. And, uh, you know, we're like, we're ignorant until we're not right. We understand that like, there's this whole different region of the world that maybe we've never been to, but 
she and uh, you know she was an outlier for me now here in Miami well I'm the outlier you know I'm the girl who's like I'm on my 100 and uh, today was 131 days of duolingo I thought oh. I, I, I thought I was going to move to Miami and like learn Spanish just like it was going to absorb through my pores or something and so ultimately all I did was master Spanish menu, right? I speak excellent, I speak excellent foreign language menus. I could like have about 16 foreign language menus memorized, but I don't really speak the languages at all. And so with Spanish, even after having a, a, a Latin family for nine years now, I am still la gringa or la americana. Well, you know, yes. the American, right? That's yes. crazy to me. But I, I'm learning to, you know, to uh, to speak Spanish halfway decently now, at least. So Duolingo is my my thing of choice. It's the thing that I've been able to stick with. So I really like it. I'll give you one more tip. So um, I would say the reverse tip to the people I would meet. So in one of my past career jobs I had, I, I managed the Hialeah market along with Miami Lakes and other other parts of Miami that are Hispanic, right? And I would meet all of these Hispanic people that just arrived or been here for like three years and they want to like master the English language. And I would tell them, listen, watch TV, turn off the subtitles and deep dive into English. Like pick your favorite movie that you've seen in Spanish or you can grasp the language and just go that way and develop the ear. And so then I'm going to reverse it with you. Put on a novella, you know. Turn off the subtitles and watch just over and over and over again. Pick like a whole series and and you'll develop the ear faster because I remember that that's what helped me when I first got here. It was it was the it was the cartoons. It was the TV shows. It was this. You just immerse yourself. Um, And it's funny because I tell everybody uh, I started doing that with French. And I started doing that with Portuguese because those are the two languages that I'm like, they're very similar to it's Spanish. So you kind of pick up, you start picking up some things, your brain starts working in a different manner. And then it just, it just happens. Not that I'm speaking fluent Portuguese or French, but I can, I understand a little more now, you know what I'm saying? And I'm easing my way into that. Well, there, there happened to be two shows on Netflix that are in Spanish that I find really um, beautiful. One of them is actually a, a detective show set in the like, I think it's set in, the, in like the 1940s. And it's a, it's a woman who is um, learning to be, she's in a police detective family, but she's, she's the better detective of the family than the chief of police who's her brother. And her father advocated for her to be, she, there's a wonderful scene with it. She and her brother are kids and the father has given them a mystery to solve in the dollhouse. And the, mm-hmm. and the girl is, is a, the one that's able to solve the mystery. And the father says to her, you know, a woman can be anything she wants. And he, she says, even a policeman. And he says, you know, hopefully someday. And so she becomes a detective and it's, it's beautiful. It's very lush, lots of gorgeous period uh, scenery. And, 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 and I just love it. And it's in set in Spanish and it, you know, it's, it's in Spanish language. So I like to watch that, but I've been watching it with the subtitles. So I'm going to try your version and watch it without yeah. and, and see no what subtitles. I can see what I can pick up. Yes. No um, subtitles, no subtitles. Yeah. So I, I want to hear more about your um, like, you're an immigrant girl, mm-hmm. right? You got an education. You went into finance. Like, what took you on that journey? What was your desire to go from that place where you were, you know, a little girl here in an unfamiliar country in an unfamiliar language to mastering the world of money? What what caused that shift? I always think that there's two worlds that when you're an immigrant, right? There's the world where you want to remember your roots and you want to be a part of that. It's part of who you are. And then there's this beautiful country that has given me every opportunity I've ever had. You know, it, it, there's no limits in this country. And I really do believe that wholeheartedly because, you know, my family came here. We all studied. Um, we're all professionals. We all got an education and there was never any limits. As long as we 
wanted to take on the courses. We wanted to get into the university. We wanted to get an education. So it, it, there's the people that say, I'm always going to be an immigrant, which I am. But at the same time, I'm full-flooded American. Like this is my country, you know, in that sense. So I remember my roots. But at the end of the day, it was up here. It's your mindset. Because I think we all have different gifts. I'm a math and science girl, always have been since I was a little girl. I remember in middle school, um, my science teacher hated science projects. And he said to us, I'm going to introduce you how to do a balsa wood bridge. And that's going to teach you about engineering and resistance points and this. So I was like, oh, my God, you mean I don't have to do you know, a theory proving a hypothesis, none of that. He's like, no, just build a bridge. And I was like, done. So from middle school to high school, I built balsa wood bridges as my science projects. And I also got other people to build balsa wood bridges because I was like, dude, this is the easiest thing to do. So the math and science always worked for me. So when I went to college, I knew I wanted to do something with math and science. And then of course, um, the world of technology was just starting. This was 1994, 1995. And um, so I did a hybrid with management information systems where it's business, but you still need to know the future, which is going to be technology. And mm-hmm. so I did the coding. Um, I did the language, but I could never see myself in front of a computer just coding or just developing, you know, like always in the tech world like that. So I, I did business as a hybrid. You know, uh, you remind me that Miami is absolutely becoming one of the fintech centers <laughs> of the world. So what's fintech? Financial technology blended together, and it is becoming its own uh, niche and really expanding out into its own industry. Um, we've seen uh, in Miami, we've, lately, we've been seeing uh, things like banking moving down here um, to the point where they're now calling it Wall Street South of this corridor from West Palm Beach all the way down to Miami. And um, Mayor Suarez, who is the mayor of uh, Miami Beach, Francis Suarez, uh, he I've seen him speak several times. He, he speaks at a lot of crypto conferences, yeah. and he always talks about fintech. Well, at one of these conferences, I discovered that he started a fintech push for Miami 10 years ago. And it really took off when there was the what I call the tweet heard around the world. Um, he uh, Somebody tweeted in um, the Bay Area at, I guess it was like 11 o'clock at night there, uh, why aren't we moving to Silicon Valley to Miami? So it's two o'clock in the morning in Miami and Mayor Suarez happens to be on Twitter and he writes back, how can I help? And it got retweeted like 2 million times and people started taking it seriously. And all of a sudden Silicon Valley started saying, hmm, why don't we consider at the same time that uh, the financial sectors of New York, I mean, they're, you know, Wall Street is Wall Street, but there, there is starting to be some movement down here. And so all of a sudden this coalescence began to happen. But it, like the, I thought that this movement of fintech started with the tweet, but the, that was like nine years into his vision, which yeah. I think is really important because you need somebody who has that vision. You need somebody who is ready to lead the charge. And what we see, you know, like today is the first day of the Bitcoin conference. It's the third year in a row that it's been yeah. here in, in Miami. There's a, There's some really... Uh, you know, all of the great people come here and converge here. Um, I was at a pitch fest yesterday. I was at a, you know, a, a family office party, uh, like Friday night. There's a lot of stuff going on that is all around this convergence of money and technology. So I feel like you're kind of in the right place at the right time. And I, oh, go ahead, please. No, yes. And I and it's funny because you mentioned last year's Bitcoin conference. And I remember where they unveiled the crypto bull. Oh well, yes, the crypto bull looks it looking like the Wall Street bull. Do you know what the big argument about that was? Yes. Freak, but they castrated him. Man. I hate to say it that way, but they took out the biggest part of what makes the bull on Wall Street such a such a sight. 
And they didn't I, think that's who are bold down here in Miami. I think we're on opposite sides of this. I think it's kind of like, you know, Barbie doesn't have any genitalia either, right? Um, like it's, you know, I, I did not need to see the, I don't know, what were they going to do? Put like the Bitcoin logo on one testicle and the Ethereum logo on another testicle. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, but I have to say, if you're going to do something that is going to be like, um, resonates, um, then you should kind of do it mirror, mirror, you know, it's funny. If you ever go into downtown Miami, when they were doing the NFT Miami conference recently, I was stuck in traffic heading down to Wynwood. And I look over to my right and I still get goosebumps. There's a picture of the dollar bill with Benjamin Franklin, right? And it says, Ben, meet Ben. And on the other one, it's like the O's and the, the, the zeros and the ones of like, if it's going digitized of Ben Franklin. And it's like the traditional Ben Franklin that we see on every dollar bill, but now it is all zeros and ones. Like it's been digitized. Like you're seeing the matrix. Oh, that's amazing. Is it still in Wynwood? Um, no, it's actually on your way. I was on my way to Wynwood, but it's, um, in downtown Miami area. So it was, it was like around there. I took a picture of it, but of course driving and all that, it doesn't come out as well. But I'll I'll look for it and I will see if it's still on the side of the building. And I I want to know if it's still there. I will definitely drive and see if it's still there because it it was such a powerful moment for anybody that is um, just even starting their interest in this crypto world or blockchain. It really does hit you when you realize what they're saying. Which is? You were used to the dollar being a physical piece of paper, but now it's moving into technology. Now you're moving into the crypto. Now you're like you're moving into the blockchain. And that's really is the future of finance. Mm. So talk more about that for you, because I know you're really into crypto and blockchain and um, that it really excites you. And it sure excites me. I mean, heck, that's why I do the show. It's hardly like I'm getting paid, right? So just share what your, uh, share what your experience has been. You know what? It's, it's, um, it started back in January. So again, networking for work. I meet this great guy out of Texas who says my friend is actually in Wynwood. He has his own incubator and also helps startups, you know, in the crypto space. I really think you should meet him. There's a lot of businesses that need guidance in their finance to be able to go for like a a capital raise or, you know, just getting their books in order so investors can want to one day purchase them to get a proper valuation. So I go to this networking space. I connect with him and uh, I am, his name is Benny Piccola. He's this energetic, blonde, young guy who I have to say knows what he knows, right? and. I just went down this this rabbit hole into the blockchain, the NFT world, the crypto world, the crypto wallets, the cold wallets, the warm wallets, the hot wallets. And it was right around the time FTX blew up. So it's it's this convergence of my world of finance, which I know and I love, with this world of technology with FTX and everything that ha- that happened, you know. And then I have someone in front of me that can help me decipher the code. So I'm like, let's figure this out. I have questions. I always have questions. And I always think we need to learn. And he starts explaining to me what is an NFT? What is the blockchain? What are the hurdles? What is happening? All this. And I start meeting these people that are immersed in this world. Ethereum, building on Ethereum. Bitcoin, how they see it as a grandfather of the, the cryptocurrency. And I um, snip it. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I, th- this bug has bit me. I want to continue to learn more because it is something that it is the future of technology. I think it is where business is heading. And I was started watching documentaries on them because at that point I'm like, let's start Googling some documentaries. So then I can start learning some more. And I kept going back to his networking events and I started building on the knowledge that I had. And then it was through him that he goes, Hey, would you like to come to quantum Miami? which is another conference that happened in February. And he's like, I can, you know, I can comp you a ticket. And I was like, absolutely. 
It's work. It's knowledge. It's I see the, the direction of where business is going. I called, you know, my leadership team. They're like, yeah, go. No one's done this. And I'm like, even if I just invest one day and Hallie, it's been amazing. It is. It's such a world that um, it's worth deep diving into at any stage of the game. It really oh, is. I so agree with you. I love how you have, have been on this journey for such a short time. You're definitely yeah. the person that has been doing this uh, most recently, like of all the people I've had on the show, all the women that have, have been on here. I usually see people like I got into the crypto space in 2017. That was when I made my first investments. And um, I have learned a lot and it's been really powerful to, you know, to see this, but I feel like a lot of women think they're too late. They're, you know, they didn't get that education. Maybe they don't have a Benny standing in front of them, you know, ready to answer questions. I, I just, you know, I, I go back to this. I had a guest on one time who was somebody that I really respected in the crypto space. And I knew she knew a lot. And I said, Hey, would you come and be a guest on the show? And she said, I can't, I learned everything I know on YouTube. And I'm like, well, where where do you think everybody else got their information? Like, you know, the university of YouTube is pretty much like what we're all looking at because it's not like, I mean, I think there's like one university that I'm aware of that's started offering a degree in, um, in understanding blockchain and crypto. But I think that that is, you know, that was before crypto winter. I don't even know if anybody's going to that now. Right. It's, and I've been through, I guess now this is my second crypto winter that I'm seeing. So we are really not too late to the party. We're super early and you're a shining example of that. You didn't say it's too late for me. I, you know, it's 2023 and I'm just getting excited about this. And when I met you, I had no idea that your journey into crypto and into blockchain had been this short because you sound like you know what you're talking about and you sound like you're so excited about the future of it. So I think that that's really a great lesson for everybody here to, to, you know, who's listening or watching this to see that this is, you know, this is something that you could be doing as well. Your interest in this can get you this enthusiastic. You, Maria Angelica, you look like I looked, you know, when I got bitten by that yeah. bug, it's like you kind of catch crypto fever and you go, yes, let me get yeah. really, really into this. I think that what happens is there's a lot of ambiguity out there because the, it's so new. So I'll tell you a story. So I went to another networking event some time ago and the speaker was the CEO of Sergio's restaurants down here in Miami. Anybody in the Latin community knows Sergio restaurants. It's just one of those staples where you have La Carreta, you have Versailles, and you have Sergio's. And you have Las Vegas. Those are like the main chain restaurants in the Cuban food world, right? And I've eaten at all of them and they're delicious. Yeah. Right. (laughs) So this is really cool. I'm getting to listen to him. And he goes into the evolution of the business, how he's third generation CEO. And he's moving along a typical presentation until he gets to blockchain. It's how he has been bitten by the blockchain NFT and how he wants to incorporate the technology. And he's telling this room full of business owners about it. And I looked around and their eyes were glazed over because they just did it. And here I am like a kid perked up listening to him going, Oh my gosh, I totally get the language you're speaking. So I go to him after his presentation and I say, I definitely understand. I've been to these conferences. It's a great business decision you're making. You're moving into an area that's just emerging. I think you're really onto something. That conversation got us to talk more that now, you know what? I got his contact info. We're discussing business, but it's that moment of, I get it. I see where you're going that I was the only one in the room of maybe 200 professionals that was like as excited as he was. And he's like, I know I lost half the crowd. <laughs> the minute I mentioned blockchain. 
That's so, that, that's such a good, that's such a good story because that tells you right there how early you are. Um, yeah. So that they weren't like, I, I, if he had said that at a crypto conference, he would have been, you know, had 18 people around him explaining about how their business could help with his business or, you know, how they were founders and he should fund them or whatever. But I mean, those conversations, people would have been excited. So the fact that you're the lone person standing up, waving the, you know, the crypto blockchain rah-rah flag, that's pretty yeah. impressive. So good. Good for and, you. But I think that a lot of women, like, it has nothing to do with gender. This is where I tell people it has to do with interest and your thirst for knowledge and looking for that opportunity. But on the other side, technology is, is intimidating. It is intimidating from going with, a, an, with an iPhone to an Android. It is, it is just an intimidating thing, but that's irrelevant of gender. It has more to do with, with, um, with age. And one of the things he said to me, the CEO of Sergios, is if I can get a 50-year-old to get excited about crypto, then I know that I've done my job. And I'm looking at him like, I'm 48. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> so you both are wandering around doing what's called in the in the crypto space, orange pilling people. And yeah. to, you know, giving them the orange pill, right? The the like take this here, take this pill, you'll understand about Bitcoin, you'll understand about crypto. So uh, thank you so much. This is like so beautiful, your story and your your journey and your uh, your willingness to really roll your sleeves up and learn something new and to continue to be that lifelong learner is so powerful. So I always like to end the show the same way. I want to ask what's one more thing that you want our audience of women to know? Leap. Leap. Take that leap of faith. Bet on yourself. And I think that a lot of women, um, we're all hesitant. I don't know if it's just humanity or women. But I know that we more of like like the surefire things. But I think leap into something and you learn as you go. And learning is a beautiful thing. If you learn how to learn, life is always exciting and it's never too old. You know, it's never too late to have the fun. So leap. Like really be in the moment and leap and then just figure it out. I say that to everybody, and everybody's like, what do you mean? I'm like, listen, I took in January a cruise. And um, we were up on this waterfall that was 17 feet high in the air. We had to jump into the into the water at the bottom. And and I said to myself, holy crap, I am I am literally leaping into something that I don't know the depths of, but it's frightening. And at the same time, it is exhilarating. And so I remember just leaping into this pool at the bottom of the waterfall and feeling the cold water and me not hitting the bottom because it was so deep. So literally and figuratively, just leap. You'll figure it out. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to have had this conversation with you. Thank you for being here with me today. If you enjoyed this episode of Goddess of Crypto, please like it, comment on it, and review it and share it with your women friends and all of the women in your life. Remember, the future of finance is female. I will see you next time. Every week, transformational wealth coach Hallie Evelyn leads a conversation that helps to ensure that women everywhere can learn to surf the coming tsunami of the new energy of money. You can find her at goddessofcrypto.me. That's goddessofcrypto.me. Be sure to subscribe to Goddess of Crypto on your favorite platform or watch the show on YouTube. And remember, wealth isn't just your privilege, it's your right. <laughs>